when we first started Crippen, there was no infighting, there was no bickering. You know, of course, we had our discrepancies, our differences, but you know, we had a built-in mechanism, a, def a mechanism that helped us stop a situation before it got bigger. Even in the 50s, in the 40s, uh, the job situation in Michigan was declining. It was already on decline. My father and my mother's two brothers, her youngest two brothers, moved, came out to California. And my father, they came out in 1958. And two years later, they sent for us. In 1960, my father sent for us. And I've been here since 19, the summer of 1960. I was 10 years old. I really grew up on 84th place between St. Andrews and Western. Uh, I've lived in on 85th and between Hoover and Figueroa. Then we moved to the West Side. I went to Washington High School. I went to Bread Hart. I, ne I never went to uh, Horace Mann, the local junior high, because I was out of high school, junior high, when I moved over here. I went to Washington. I went to Fremont. And basically, those are the two high schools I went to. Who was one of the first guys from the streets that you met, if that, you can remember? Well, one of the first persons from the streets right now would be Robert Finch. I've been, I met Robert Finch in 1964, later part of 64, early 65. I've been knowing Robert Finch since he was dang near nine years old. Erskine Jones, which is Mad Dog, Ricardo Bub Sims, which is my crime partner, uh, Big Bob, which is another one of my crime partners, uh, Johnny Barnett, Tow Truck Johnny from uh, up in the hundreds, uh, Minnesota out of the hundreds, Hulk out of the hundreds. Man, I can go on and the list could go on and on. I knew a gang of brothers be pre cripping And then we brought our sense of unity and loyalty that we had together into Crippen. Who really got the ball rolling on the west side? Well, let's put it like this. Doc is, is very instrumental in bringing uh, Tookie around and very instrumental in starting Crips. Now, all the media, this, only, I'll do it this way. The hundreds say it was conceived in the hundreds. Okay, I'll grant that. It was conceived in the hundreds. But where did it actually take birth? It's St. Andrew's Park. If you had all your crypt meetings with East Side, West Side, and Compton at St. Andrew's Park, where's the history? It's not in the hundreds. Of course, they have their history. You can't take it away because it's all part of West Side. But when you talk about where should West Side history start, St. Andrews Park. The East, when the East Side started, and they started coming over here, what did they hang at? St. Andrews Park. They didn't hang at Sportsman's Park because for why? They couldn't. Because of the Sportsman Boys. Because of the at. Sportsman Park Boys. Now, I grew up with them also. Alan Ennis. One of the big crip killers, he, they had a big bond on his head. But I grew up with these cats. I knew them. I was one of the few cats who go up there and wouldn't nothing happen to them, to, uh, to sports and park. Because these are the brothers I went to school with pre-crips. These are the brothers that I party with pre-crips. 90s, 100s, 70s, 80s. We didn't limit ourselves to just one location. We ran all up and down this area. So how did the, the Sportsman Park Boys even become rivals with the West Side Crips? From the brothers in the hundreds and the eighties going up there and want to dominate them, beat them up, and they just band together and said enough is enough. And that's how a lot of rival games from Crips started because Crips got out of hand. And when you start being the prayer in your neighborhood, you, of course you're gonna have opposition. Now, uh, the smacks were definitely from out the hundreds, right? Smacks were definitely out the hundreds. And, and what about, what do you say to those that say, well, the smacks are, are the founders of the West Side Crips? For one, if you say you're a smack, that was mostly for junior high school. And for one, you were too young. You're too young. If you saying you come up under barefoot pookie, you're way too young. Because the youngest person, if I can't, if I, it's three. Barefoot Pookie, Warlock, and Keith Henderson were the only ones I knew that were 14 and 15. 
Everybody else is 16, 17, 18, 19. Now, you were one of the oldest ones. Well, let's put it like At that. At that time, you was like 19, <coughs> 19 going on 20. And a lot of people hit me up and asked me, you know, why was Judson Baycott 19, 20 hanging out with 16, 17-year-olds at the time? Because Tookie and Doc and all of them are about well, three, three, four years younger than you. Well, let's put it like this. I wasn't hanging with Tookie and Doc and them. I hung with Big Bob, Dotty, which was all around my age. Mad Dog, which was all around my age. Now, this is who I hung with. Now, Tookie came later. Took came later. I never ran with, I never hung, really hung out with Took. I done hung out with Don Archie a few times, of course, because he's one of the young brothers of the neighborhood. I done hung out with him a few times. But as far as me, my crew was Big Bob, John Carter, which is Dr. He, who never became a crip. And uh, basically, that's it. That's who I ran with. Now, flipping through the pages of your book, I noticed the, the Robert Ballou incident is mentioned in there. Now, we had talked about that in, de um, in depth maybe three or four years ago. Yeah. Um, what would you like to say about that now? Now that you got the book out, it's published, you mentioned it in there. Uh, what else can we talk, say or talk about regarding that Robert Ballou incident? Because that, that's really the, the incident that put it all put, on the put, map. Put it all on the map. Okay, let's, let me just reiterate this much of it. Uh, it's true. I had nothing to do with it. If I had something to do with it, I already did 12 years. I might as well confess to it. You know, there's nothing else they can do to me. I'm just telling the truth. I had nothing to do with it. If you, anybody want to know the true, true history of what really happened that night, buy this book. You get convicted, and you're sent to First Tracy? Uh, no, I went to San Quentin in 1970. I got, we got busted March 1972, April 1973. I was on my way to the prison. On my way to prison, I, my first stop was uh, after we Chino the reception center was San Quentin. I stayed in San Quentin from '73 to '75, and from '75 to '78 I was in Tracy, and from '78 to '83 I went to CMC East for a psych evaluation. In, back in those days, if you had a murder, you had to go get a psych evaluation. The only place they had them at was CMC East you know, the program, so I had to go through there, and I did five years there, and in 1983, November the 15th, I was released. Now, let's talk about your, your first stint at San Quentin. Um, that's like a gladiator academy prison, huh? Yeah, I was, a, you know, I was the youngest person in San Quentin in 1973. There were no Crips in San Quentin in 1973. I was the only Crip. Now, I had friends that I knew from the streets, older cats that was there, and uh, they took me to name Wayne, Sidney Birdsong, Felix Fox, uh, Big John, you know, these brothers that took me to name Wayne and showed me the ropes. And you also crossed paths with the legendary Craig Munson. Oh, yes. Talk about big, that briefly. Big Truck. Uh, I met Truck and Tracy. Well, I had seen him on the streets. I never had any inter interaction with him. You know, I seen him in passing. That's Truck. Okay, okay. But in Quentin, I had an opportunity to really meet him and talk with him. The kindest brother you ever want to meet. The softest spoken brother you ever want to meet. But one of the deadliest also. Forgive me, Craig. <laughs> well, I think everyone knows his reputation now. It's been over, what, 50 years? 50 years, yeah. Um, he was known as one of the most gangster gangsters gangster in the street. <laughs> uh, you know what? If you really look at it, he's one of the reasons Crip started. Because he wouldn't allow... Raymond to be part of his crew, to bring in a, some more people, a, a baby, a, a spinoff. So, pushed him to the side. Now, what did he? What did he help create? Crips. I I did some research on you when you were in prison and found an article that was written by the local newspaper mm -hmm. talking about you getting stabbed in the chest. I believe. Yes, I um, got stabbed twice in the chest area and under the arms. And at one time, I only thought he hit, stabbed me here because I thought I put my arm up to block it. And I just thought I was stabbed here. And then when they, somebody heard somebody say, uh, man on the gun reel, they, he dropped his knife and he ran. You know, and I just backed up because my cell is right there. I backed up against my cell. And I'm like, damn, I put my hand up. I said, damn, this boy didn't stab me. Now I got to go to this infirmary and they going to probably want to put me in the hole. And by this time, it's another brother got up to, on me. He said, uh, Baycott, you all right? I said, yeah, man, a white boy just stabbed me in the arm. And that's the last thing I remember. I woke up in the hospital. 
and then you realized you had more injuries than that. Yes, I did. The doctor told me that when the doctor come in and see me, he said if my heart hadn't have jumped, I wouldn't be here to talk to him right now. He was showing me the x-rays where the, where the knife wound went in, and he said during the activities, my heart jumped, and the, and the knife missed it. From the 70s to the 80s, all the 70s and all the 80s, the most volatile times in prisons ever. It, it, it all had to do, and especially in San Quentin, it's, everything is cut along racial lines. And uh, the, the big king of, the, of San Quentin back then, quote unquote, Mexican mafia. Okay, they dictated everything. Who can sell dope, where it come from, who you can buy your dope from, you know, uh, gambling activities in the prison, they, you know, everything. Anything illegal, they wanted to control. Now, 75, 76, the demographics of San Quentin start to change. Now you got a lot of Crips coming. They still got the seven of lives, but now 1978 to 79, when they start giving them 25 years of life and them 30 years of life, that's when you start getting all your hardcore Crips coming in and the Mexican Mafia couldn't control them. Couldn't go to them and say, well, you got to buy your dough from us. Look here, partner, we ain't got to buy nothing from you. No, we our own entity. We get it from our people. You know, we got, we got, a, we got a hookup. But the Mexican Mafia didn't want to go for it, so they start. They put a red light on all Crips. So how did how did the Mexican Mafia even be able to have so much power in prison with all the other groups? Where you got blacks, you got whites, you got the Northerners, and then the Mexican Mafia is the Southerners. Why them? What what made them different than all these other groups to where they wanted to control everything? Because for one, you know, it was a it's it's, it's that particular mindset, you know, and then. Blacks in prison back then didn't have the same mindset as the, as the Mexican Mafia. And then one thing I do give them, when the Hispanic guy come into the pen, if he's not a part of the Mexican Mafia, but he's in the gang, he's part of the Mexican Mafia. They get their backing from all their people. We don't. Bloods kick it with Bloods, Crips kick it with Crips, and the Crips got a problem, let them handle it. Bloods got a problem, let them handle it. We didn't stick together like they did. I always wondered why didn't the BGF do the same thing that the Mexican Mafia did and pretty much control every crip or blood that comes into prison and, and create a nice power base? Well, for one, a lot of crips tried it, but they didn't like the structure. You know, it's... Crips and bloods, you have to understand, bring a di divisiveness when they come in. They're going to bring that divisiveness in. And Crips weren't going to take no orders from somebody talking about black power and we're going to do this and we're going to discriminate, we're going to do this. And no, they were not. They were not. Not back then. They were not. And they looked up at the BGF with disdain. Thanks for watching StreetGangs.com. Please like and share the video you just watched and leave a comment below to tell us what you think. You can also watch two of our previous episodes to the right. Please visit the link to our Patreon page and support our campaign. And don't forget to subscribe.